Okay, so to actually visualize changes over time or time itself, there's actually no magic trick to doing it. Um, as long as you understand the grammar of graphics where we're taking a variable in our data set and mapping it to some aesthetic, that's all we're doing with uh, time visualization. Time is just another variable that can be mapped onto an aesthetic. Um, it's generally measured as like months or a year column or an actual like timestamp. If you have website visits and you're going to have like second by second timestamps, um, anything that measures the passage of time can be put in a column and then you can use that column however you want in your graph. Um, so it can be on the x-axis, it can be on the y-axis, it can be um, a facet, um, you can fill by time, you can color by time, you can do basically any aesthetic you want. Um, you can map it to your column that shows time. That's kind of the main secret of visualizing time. It's just, it's a column, do something with it. Um, you can use any sort of geom to show it. You can show lines. That's kind of a standard way to show it where you just show like changes in different things over time. You can use columns, you can use points, you can use heat maps, density plots, geom ridges, you can show maps, you can do all sorts of things. Um, as long as there's, there's a time variable in there, you're visualizing time. Um, in general, the only kind of main principle you should keep in mind is the order that you use. Um, the best convention is to follow um, the reading order of the language that you're creating the graph for. So if for English audiences, we read from right to left and from top to bottom. And so make sure that the progression of time in whatever plot you're making kind of follows that convention um, where you're starting at the left, going towards the right. Um, yeah, that is correct. Um, and then working your way down. And so if you have like a ridge plot, you don't want to put um, the first year down at the bottom and the last year at the top because you're trying to do a progression of time. So you'll start with the first year and then go down to the last year. Um, and that's kind of the main rule of thumb is make the plot like you're reading it. If you're making it for an audience that um, reads Hebrew or Arabic or another right to left language, then have the progression of time go that way um, to match the reading direction. But that's kind of the main rule of thumb. So now we're going to look at some examples of different geoms and different aesthetic mappings for a time column. Um, so one of the most common ways here um, that you'll see often is having um, time on the x-axis because again we're reading from left to right um, and then having a line or either or either a line or columns show the actual values over time. So if you look at this, this is the initial unemployment claims um, from 1969 up until just um, May yesterday, or May a couple days ago, late May um, 2020. So you can see the huge impact that COVID-19 has had on unemployment, um, going up to almost 8 million claims in one week. Um, and it's starting to drop down now, but this is like nuts. Um, and so, but this is just shown with a line, like this is just G online, and that's all we have. Um, here, the New York Times, um, on May 9th, they had on their home, on their front page for that day, they showed a column chart. Instead of showing um, the actual numbers of employment claims, this was just the, the change in monthly unemployment or weekly unemployment. And so sometimes the bars go up when, when people are getting more jobs and then the bars go down. So it's kind of jumping all around up here until you get to the pandemic and then they had to drop all the way down the whole margin of their page um, to show that. But Fundamentally, these are just, it's time on the x-axis and shown with either geom line or geom call, and there's, there's how you visualize time. Um, another example of this comes from Alberto Cairo's chapter. Um, this, instead of using lines or bars, this is using a heat map. You can use a heat map to show changes over time. Uh, the time is on the x-axis again. They have quarters and years up here, so you can see the first quarter of 2000, the third quarter of 2004, etc. Um, and then each of these things are filled by um, the amount of exports that country is doing as a percentage of GDP. And so because it's a heat map, you can see United States and Japan are huge exporters. Um, countries like Ireland and Luxembourg are not, and they become less so over time. Um, and you can see the decline in exports in countries like the UK and Portugal and Greece over here. So you can still track changes over time. No lines, no bars. This is a heat map that shows you this stuff. Um, another example is this. You've done this in one of your exercises um, to show changes in life expectancy over time, <clears throat> where 
This is the whole distribution of life expectancy in all the countries in the world for 1952. And it has the median right here. And so you can see we're reading it from 1952 down. So time is on the y-axis and you can see it growing as we get um, further on in time. And it's also filled by kind of this value here. So you can see it's going from more um, dark blue green to this peach color. And so it's showing the changes in time. But again, all we took is a year column and we mapped it onto one of the axes and we're seeing time now. Um, you can also animate with time. Um, this is the, the Gapminder uh, TED talk that you watched or the four minute brief video that Hans Rosling had. Um, in that case, time was mapped onto the animation of it. It wasn't on the x-axis, it wasn't on the y-axis because you had um, GDP per capita and life expectancy. Um, the way they visualized time there is they just essentially had a ton of different facets and they animated between each of the facets. And that's how we got the, the time-based animation here. You can also include time in maps. This is from Alberto Cairo's book too. It shows the growth of Walmart over um, since 1962 up to 2006. So you can actually see like it started off with one store in Arkansas. And then as you go up year by year, um, it starts expanding and expanding until you get to this point in 2006 where Walmart is everywhere. Um, in this case, there's no like x-axis. The x-axis is technically like latitude and longitude. Those are x and y there. Um, so time here is mapped on the facets, kind of like the, um, the Gapminder example. Um, but instead of animating it, they're just all faceted like small multiples. And this is another thing you can do. This comes from Kieran Healy. Um, he's been tracking mobility, um, changes in mobility. Apple has provided um, anonymized CSVs about um, how often people are moving relative to um, January 13th. So how, how often people are driving more or are driving less. And so you can see those changes here. Um, so he starts back at January. So you can see like these are work days and then these are weekends and then weekdays and weekends. So that's kind of the typical pattern. And then for all of these cities, once lockdown happened, um, mobility stopped completely. Um, but in most of these places, so this is May 23rd, um, when I'm recording this. And so at this point, lots of these cities are coming out of lockdown. Um, not all are, and Arbor is still very locked down. Austin still is, Denver still is, but you have other places um, like Boise, they're back up to their previous levels back in January. Um, and again, the time is in this case mapped onto the x-axis um, and it's faceted by um, city instead, but it's still showing changes in time through small multiples and it, it helps tell a good story here. If you want to see the full chart of this, he has 100 cities here. This is only if the first few rows. Again, if you look at the presenter view for this and press P, you can see the link for his whole blog post about this. Um, one thing to keep in mind though, is while you can map time onto whatever aesthetic you want, don't go too crazy with it because you can actually get really confusing charts instead. So this right here is called a tornado plot. Um, this was made a couple weeks ago um, during the pandemic to show how fast um, the pandemic has been spreading in different countries. And so the way they visualize this is time is no longer on either the X or the Y axis. It's not mapped by color. Each of those colored lines are different countries. Um, it's mapped um, following the, the lines here. So if you look at this blue line, that's France. And so here's the, the change in deaths per day and then their average deaths per day for March 30th and then March 31st, and then April 1st, and then April 2nd, and April 3rd, and then April 4th is when they stopped making this graph here. And so you, the progression of time is here, but it's like spiraling around. Um, some of these countries, like this purple one, that's China, they're just like looping around this axis here. And this is really hard to interpret. They had to have a whole blog post accompanying these pictures, which again, you can see in the link here in the presenter view, um, where the basic intuition is like they had to explain in the blog post that when the curve crosses the left here, it means the slope of the number of deaths or the first derivative of deaths is starting to decrease. But then once it crosses back over here, then deaths are increasing again. That's what it's showing. And even with that explanation, I'm not 100% sure what this means. Um, people over the past few weeks have been trying to interpret this differently. Um, one version of it is this. These two plots are the same. 
Um, if we assume x here is a time variable, like this is month one, month two, month three, etc. And then here's some random y variable I made up. So it's going up, it's going down, it's going up, down, up. This is the tornado plot version of it. And so you start at two. And so this means like you're still going up because you're on this side of that dotted line. And so the slope is still increasing, like it's a positive slope. But as soon as you go after four, then the slope is negative because it's going down. And so at time five, you are in negative slope land. But as soon as you get to time six, you're back up to positive slope land. So really, it's trying to show the derivative of the line. Um, and it's just going to bounce back and forth as the line wiggles. And so that's what they're trying to show, um, which neat. This makes it more intuitive, kind of, but still, like, why? Um, you could just do this, and it would show basically the same story minus derivatives, because who understands derivatives? Um, you also see things like this. Um, Alberto Cairo had some good examples of this, of this path plot where it's similar to the tornado plot. Instead of having x and y show time, either x or y show time, time is shown by mapping uh, or by doing this path. So you can see the, the different unemployment and inflation rates in the United States. This is real data. Um, starting in 1990, and then unemployment goes up and inflation goes down. And then in 1992, unemployment goes up more and inflation goes down. And then like, you can trace this, and it's just kind of going all over the map and it's not really telling you anything about the relationship between unemployment and inflation over time. That's the story they're trying to tell here is they're trying to say that these two things move together or they don't move together or something. I don't know what's happening here because that story gets lost. Um, if you're trying to show how two different variables move over time, don't do this path stuff. You can split it into two different panels, um, just like we were doing with the dual y-axis stuff. Rather than having two y-axes in there, or rather than having this weird path thing, here you can see that unemployment's going up and inflation's going down. They kind of move in opposite directions, and that's super apparent here in 2010, where an, an inflation drops down to deflationary levels um, during the Great Recession, and unemployment was super high. And so this shows you know, the relationship between these two variables a lot better, um, I think, than this. Um, so tornado plots and these spiral plot things are possible. But again, you need to think about the story you're trying to tell and how apparent it is for people trying to read your story and, and try to understand what you're communicating. Um, so those are a whole bunch of different ways of visualizing time that is by no means exhaustive of every possible method. Um, Basically, just stick the year column or the time column somewhere on your plot and see what it looks like. And if it makes sense, then go with it. If it doesn't make sense, like these, then put it somewhere else. And that's how you visualize time.